Thanks a lot. Millions of lessons learned on electronic napkins on the way to freeing education. As academics, we have to start with the definition, of course. We looked that up in the Encyclopedia Galactica, and this is what the Encyclopedia Galactica has to say. Of course, imagine that sound. <laughs> napkins were invented in the early oh, napkins were invented in the early 20th century to conduct informal one-on-one -on -one lessons in a bar or a cafe. This resulted from everybody noticing that regular classroom lectures are good for only two things. First, looking important as a lecturer, and second, getting a nap as a student, hence the name napkin. <laughs> In 1981, Donald E. Knuth, who invented about everything in computer science, as you know, <laughs> turned the napkin, the paper napkin, into a semi-electronic napkin. This is a screenshot of one of his recordings, drawing with paper and pencil uh, and being recorded with a TV camera. He explains tech, by the way, in that lecture. In 2007, Salman Khan highly popularized that style of lecturing on YouTube with his mathematics, introductory mathematics courses on, or videos on YouTube. In uh, 2009, I started with my mathematics and computer science videos on YouTube, pretty much the same style with inverted colors. If you notice, it's black on white, not white on black. <laughs> And eventually this year, Sebastian and I met when we started working for Udacity, creating classes for Udacity's uh, uh, <coughs> website, massive open online courses. That's the actual topic of this talk. MOOCs, massive open online courses. Actually, there's two types of massive open online courses, the C MOOCs and the X MOOCs. The C MOOCs are the earlier ones. Uh, focusing, say, on social sciences and uh, philosophy and things like that. Um, this is not what we're going to cover. We're co going to cover the current style of MOOC, that's the X MOOC, um, the Stanford style of MOOCs, <laughs> what, has, what has been introduced by Udacity. Um, and as I guess everybody has seen in the media, these sort of quote unquote napkins are in high demand. Udacity was the first. Stanford spin-off to start this as a business. Uh, Coursera was quickly after that. Coursera is now the biggest player in town. Um, with Stanford and lots of other universities contributing to the pool of MOOCs uh, hosted on Coursera. And then there's edX, which started out as a cooperation between the MIT and uh, Harvard University in Boston. Now it includes Berkeley as well and the University System of Texas as well. All within one year. So this really looks like a high demand. Now Sebastian is going to talk about the financial perspective. Yeah, so the, the question of course is why is, is there such a high demand? So, so why do so many online courses uh, spring up? Why are there so many companies being founded around online courses? And um, one way to look at this is the financial perspective, but since this is kind of a lecture, we're going to quiz you as, as <laughs> like we quiz our students. So um, what do you estimate is the cost of tuition and living for one year um, at an average US university? You can just show your hands. So who thinks it's $10,000 per year? Nobody. 20,000. Okay. 30,000, uh, 40,000? It's actually not that expensive if you go to a public U.S. university. It's only, only <laughs> $20,000. Uh, what about Harvard? $40,000. $60,000? 100000 um, Officially, they say 60000 So um, it, it might be a bit higher, but, but that's tuition. Now, what about Germany, actually? Um, we're, we have a cheap education system. Um, what does it cost, cost to study in Germany for one year at a German university? Tuition and living. Nothing? One thousand uh, dollars? Euros, euros. One thousand euros? Ten thousand? 
exactly, living. So, so you spend around 10,000 euros for, for, for tuition and living. So everybody is investing a lot of time and money into going to university. So, so if, if you're a student, um, well, you, you spend a few years going to university. You also spend a lot of money, but so between 10,000 euros and uh, $60,000, depending on where you want to be educated. Um, but also as a society, so um, we're investing time, obviously, so, so the universities cost a lot of money, um, but also we're, we're, you know, we're hiring very expensive people um, who supposedly are very highly qualified uh, professors and asking them to do lecturing. So, so they could spend their time on something else, they could spend their time on, on doing research, um, cutting edge science and all that stuff. So, that is one of the aspects why, why we think that, that there's such a high interest in online courses because obviously once the course is recorded and, and you can just play it, um, you can do that as, as a, at a very low cost uh, per student. But that's only the one side of the equation. I think the other side, um, oh sorry, so um, the question of course is, is all this time and money that we're investing, is that a smart investment to do? Um, which is the question you have to ask if, you, if you're talking about online courses. And as a student, I think the answer is obviously yes. Um, provided you can afford to, to go to university, you just should. Um, it's, it's still uh, a very good route to, to you know, getting a good job, landing a high salary, although there has been a diminishing return over the past decades. It's no longer a guarantee um, to, to you know, get the high profile job. Um, but still, as a student, it's a good investment. As a society, um, as I just said, I think we're a bit overpaying because we're hiring, you know, we have all these huge buildings with very expensive people in there and we ask them to give the same lecture every year again and again and again. Um, so one way of looking at this might be that, that the, the you know, recording courses online um, is actually quite a good way to, to make this a smarter investment into education. But obviously that's only one side of the equation. Um, you're going to talk about the other one. Yeah. So what's in there for society? What does society actually need? Um, again, we start with the quiz. When were the first universities founded? 200 years ago, 400 years ago, 800 years ago? Who says 200 years ago? Nobody? Okay. Show of hand, 400 years ago? Okay, some. 800 years? Okay, you're right. The majority. Too so, easy quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the University of Bologna, Cambridge, Oxford and some others date from that age. So they were founded for a pretty long time ago to satisfy some need of that society in those day and age. The first modern university, so a university that integrates, tightly integrates research and teaching, a university that aims at educating, uh, uh, that, prov that providing personal education, uh, personal growth and a university that um, is no longer a university that does research just for the sake of research. A modern type of university. How old is that? 50 years? Anybody? 100 years? More? 200 years? Uh, you see, actually 200 years. I guess half of you said over 100 years, actually 200 years. The Humboldt, what's now called the Humboldt University in Berlin, Berlin was the first one of that style. Berlin University at that time. Um, so we're dealing with a pretty old model of university. Does that still fit to the needs of today's society? What has survived is the model. You get a university certificate, you use that certificate to get a job, you are trained on the job and maybe after a while you decide, oh, I do a master's degree and whatever, uh, go back to university. Um, this is the model from the outside, the formal model, but does that really work? What society would need is that those students are able to do something, some, something, some mastery of useful skills. They should be able to apply their knowledge. They should not just possess knowledge, they should be able to apply it, which is a different story. Um, they should have a portfolio of skills. If I employ one of these students, I should be knowing what they can do and what they cannot do. It shouldn't be just a list of, of subject names on a certificate. And of course, a big portion would be personal development. We have a nice term for that in German, Bildung. It's the, not education. That's which is not yeah. education. It should be more than education. Um, the university should provide that. And 
I guess if, as everybody knows from the media in these days, universities have tough problems with these needs of society. We've still got the model, but we hardly fulfill those needs. The question is, do MOOCs come to the rescue? And more of them and even more of them. Could that help? So here's what the optimists have to say. And the optimists about the MOOCs are, well, generally, they're, they're in America right now. More specifically, mostly of them are Californian. Um, they, they say MOOCs uh, will come to the rescue. Um, so their view is, is the following. Um, well, first of all, they're using this statistic as an example, which, which again, we're going to do as a quiz. So I'm going to explain that. So take two groups of students. One group of students receives a normal university lecture. So, so what, yeah, the average, you know, the professor standing there lecturing to the students. The other group all receive individual tutoring. And now both of these groups take a test, the same test. Uh, and my question to you is, so how much better are those students that have received individual tutoring compared to the group that has received a lecture? So who thinks there's no difference? Okay, a few people. Next option I'm going to offer you, 73% of the individually tutored students are better than the average lectured student. Okay, that's quite a lot. Who thinks it's 98%? And it is surprisingly actually 98%. So, face-to-face -face tutoring? Or? Yes, individual face-to-face -face tutoring. Not online. <laughs> yes. No, not online. So, so it's a study that was done individual one-to-one -one tutoring. Um, and that's, of course, what the optimist thinks. Oh, it's great, you know, because if you, it, it, of course, it's not only about recording a video, but it's also adding interactive elements to that so that you provide quizzes to the students that they can work on. You have automatically graded homework. You can provide cues and exercises if it's done right. It's not just the video that you watch, but you can actually add lots of interactive elements around that, and that's great. So basically, everybody could lear be learning from the best teachers for free. You just have to, you know, find the best teacher somewhere out there in the world, get them to do a course, then you record it, and it's there forever. Um, you know, everybody could learn from, from Richard Feynman about physics if, if he were still alive. Um, students can be engaged on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Of course, it's a sort of mechanical engagement, which, uh, but still, nevertheless, you know, the computer is very patient. If uh, you can achieve mastery, if you have, if you have a question um, and you want to ask that question five times, you just click backwards on the video and you watch it again, or you ask a question to the forum. It's infinite patience uh, until you have understood the, the concept. So that's one of the things that the optimists are saying, is we can actually, at very low cost, emulate free one-to-one -one tutoring. And then if you're even more idealistic, you can say, of course, we're also going to change education for the better. Um, we're going to free education of bureaucracy, you know, that 200-year-old system and, and the bad old teaching habits, that lecture where, you know, there's, there's really no connection to the students at all. Um, we can also, t or we could also turn education into a data-driven science um, because there's lots of data being recorded while a student is taking one of these courses. So um, and we're going to talk more about that later. We can actually see where the students are failing, where we as lecturers have been failing, where we have not explained something right. So that we then see a drop in attendance or we see a drop in the, in the uh, test scores um, on, the, on the quizzes that come in between. Um, if you go very far, uh, the, the, the kind of most idealistic concept is, I, I think, uh, the inverted classroom, where people say, well, normally it's uh, this way. You go to a lecture, and then you actually learn the stuff, uh, or, you know, to learn, and then you practice doing homework. Um, what if you first learned about this concept using massive open online courses at home, and then the lecturer is actually there for you once you go to the university or once you go into the classroom to practice those concepts with you. So uh, Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy, basically says technology can actually humanize the classroom because there's more time to spend or more meaningful time that you can spend with your students. But of course, that's just the <laughs> optimist view. So yeah. I'll leave. The generic pessimist. <laughs> um, again, a quiz to indicate one of the major issues. So this year, 40,000 Stanford, no, this year, two, uh, this year 40,000 students took that massive open course 
uh, by Stanford on natural language processing. How many of these actually made it through the course? Three percent? Quite a number, okay, 12 percent. <laughs> You're all pessimists. Pessimists. <laughs> 23 percent. Yeah, just a few. Okay, you're, you're you're right. You're so, <laughs> <laughs> so seemingly there seems to be an issue about this type of education. You obviously cannot fulfill all those promises that you just heard about. And Jörn is actually a professor, so imagine him, you know, <laughs> just having 3% of his students pass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody would be interfering. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. So, uh, criticism number one is you are way too much optimistic. It doesn't work like that. We've been doing distant education for decades, if not centuries. It doesn't work like that. You need the right type of students. Um, and at any rate, you, you can't have these type of successes that you suppose. Um, oops, I'm too quick. Um, then the lack of quality. If you actually look into what's being recorded, what's being published as MOOCs, admittedly the quality is not that high on average. Um, the didactics is debatable. Um, these courses do not fit together. It's, it's not a jigsaw puzzle. These are not pieces of a puzzle that fit together. It's just scattered knowledge. There is no evaluation going on besides journalists journalists looking at these courses or even professors like Rolf Schumeister looking at these courses but there is no real double uh, evaluation going on and we're not using tons of the technical amenities that we have um, video conferencing, uh, virtual reality, interactive experiments done online, stuff like that, it's not being used as much as it could be, it's just more or less videotaped lectures plus quizzes, electronic quizzes. Um, and then, if you're not paying, the regular quote, if you're not paying for it, um, you're not the customer, you're the goods, you're the product. Um, if you're not paying, something is wrong. You should be careful. So most of these courses are free, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess most of you yeah. know, but, but taking these courses is actually free. So, mm -hmm. so whether it's on Coursera, on edX, or Udacity, um, you just have to provide an email address, basically. That's the second aspect of open. Open means open to everybody, not depending on any prior certificate, and open meaning you don't need to pay. Um, so somebody has to pay. Who is going to pay? Are you paying with your data? Hmm, that's tricky. And a general comment about distance education, if you send out in broadcast mode, if you send out these videos, if you have the same quizzes for everybody, that's the one size fits all approach. Which is of course very different than the traditional university. That <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very different. <laughs> As we said, this is... <laughs> These are, these are the generic arguments we're going <laughs> to discuss yeah, you're the bad what we think about them. Um, and of course, if you think about university providing a certificate, some sort of authoritative certificate, at the end, um, you want to know that that person who took that course actually also was the one who took the test and that there was no cheating on the test and there is no plagiarism going on. Of course, there's huge ways, huge, a huge deal of plagiarism and cheating going on in these courses. Um, again, you might say, mm, don't we have the same in regular universities going on? But in this case, it's a big argument against MOOCs. Yeah. And it's also on different scales. So there's actually websites that will offer to take your courses for you. So you, you can basically sign up to the university, then you sign up to the, I don't know who that even is, but, but they, they will, they will take, take that course for you, you know, submit your exams and everything. It's, it's, it's the same one. So, so the same thing that you can educate 40,000 students, you can also have one guy you know, taking 40,000 exams. <laughs> <laughs> now you can continue. About <laughs> what we yes. Learned. So. What we have so, so this, yeah, exactly. So, so this is this is kind of the, the general picture. So, so there's those those free massive open online courses. Uh, some people are getting very excited about this. Um, the basically, it's the Californians getting excited about it, and the Germans and the East Coast getting you know 
criticizing it, but maybe that's too. So, but the, so, so what we came here to talk about is what we have learned, because just as, as Jörn said, you know, we, well, probably we are part of that debate in, in some way, but we just gave, gave two courses. Um, and so we wanted to just tell you our experience from, from giving those courses. We played a very small part, um, just to illustrate how small a part we played. So, guess, what's the total number of users claimed by the major MOOCs, so, so Coursera, edX, Udacity, as of 2012? So, how many users do they claim in total? Do they claim 100,000? One million. 2.5 million. Yes, yes it's 2.5 million. Um, of course, that's just users. So, so you all know, is it unique double users? Counted. Yeah, double counted. Um, do, do these users actually make it all the way through? But this is the number of people that are at least willing to give their email address for free. <laughs> some email address of theirs. <laughs> some, some email address <laughs> into a, a web form. <laughs> so, 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 and Jörn and I, I mean, our courses are in the range of, of a few thousands. So, so we're, we're a very, very small, small part in that. Um, but still, we had, we had several good experiences. So the first thing that we experienced is that there is a craving to learn out there. Um, this is an offering where there's high demand for it. Um, both our courses went online, I think, yours in September, uh, my, mine in October, and we chose the, you know, the really highly popular topics. So Jörn gave a course on differential equations. Um, I taught theoretical Everybody computer loves science. Topic. Yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> so, so, you know, not, talking about mass education, um, those are probably not the topics that he would choose. And nevertheless, we had thousands of students actually taking those courses and, uh, you know, having, having online, like, vigorous online debates on uh, differential equations and NP completeness and all of those topics. Um, of course, we know we're picking the easy students, so, so we're having this offering out there and, and it's easy, if, if you think you know, you're offering this to the world, it's easy to find uh, thousands of students who are actually interested in, in, in these kind of things. Um, such as probably this audience, but nevertheless, um, there, you know, there, there's this, you put this offering out there and immediately people come. So, so there is just a high demand to, to learn things. Um, what we both also found is that the freedom provided by these massive open online courses is good. Um, because it's, well, there's no accreditation, right? There's no formal verification of these courses, which is often a criticism, but actually it's wonderful if you're a teacher because you can try new things. You're not bound to any curriculum. You can, you can basically give the course uh, in a way that you think, uh, that, that you think it, it should be done instead of the way it has always been done. So uh, one example that, that you know, you might understand is in, in, in theoretical computer science. Uh, you cannot take a theoretical computer science course without talking about a Turing machine. Um, actually, you can, but everybody, you know, everybody has has that Turing machine concept in there, so it's always stayed in there. And and when when I made my course, I found out you you can just throw it out. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, but that would never have been possible at a traditional university Same. because. Same for the differential equations yeah. course. I do differential equations in depth, even partial differential equations, without mentioning the integral. I'm never integrating anything in that course. Yeah. And it's a good course. <laughs> so you say. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you can teach the way you want to be. And actually, the, the, the good thing is also you can be a teacher. I mean, I mean, Jörn does this uh, professionally. You, you teach a lot. You're, you're a professor at a university. I do totally different stuff, but I just wanted to teach theoretical computer science because I like the subject. Um, I would never have had the opportunity to do that for, for any audience that makes sense. So, so that's also something great. You can be a teacher for something that's, you know, that you're passionate about and then stop being a teacher again. That's very good. Um, what we also learned, interaction. So, so this, is, this is one of the weaknesses we think of most of the courses that are out there uh, right now. Um, because many people just say, uh, you know, if you write on the napkin in a bar, the most important part is not somebody writing on the napkin and watching them do it. It's the explanation and the interaction you have with that person. And so you need to use technology to emulate that kind of interaction. You need to have 
quizzes. So, so what, what we do basically after just on average, I think every three minutes of explaining a concept, we'll ask a question to the students that they have to answer. So you have to have a multiple choice selection, you have to calculate something, and only then can you, can you go on in, in the course. Um, so this, this constant interaction, reinforcing, seeing ha have the students learned it, that is a very important element. Um, we should be talking about the style of quizzes. Actually, the, the style of quizzes that we're doing right now in this mm -hmm. lecture is not the right style of quizzes. You should be asking quizzes, quizzes that demand thinking, that provoke thinking, <laughs> in-depth thinking, not just guessing. Guessing doesn't cut it. Yeah, so, so we are obviously constrained to multiple choice uh, most of the time, or we do, we do some, some calculation. Um, but, um, or programming, which is or a good programming. Time. Yes, programming is also something that's possible. Obviously, you know, the, the social sciences still have to figure out what they are going to do in Python, but uh, <laughs> philosophy in Python, that's but even even you know beyond the quizzes um, we are both very active on the forums of our courses and and the students are also very active so that's actually a second very important part you can get lots of students debating with each other asking the questions about things they haven't understood and I think it's the same with your course what always amazes me they ask lots of questions that are actually beyond the scope of the course so you can really see they've understood the concept and now they want to learn new stuff advance their knowledge which I find very amazing I've never seen that at university um, <laughs> you know and they do find all my mistakes in the, in oh, the yes, quizzes. They're, they're relentless. Um, and the programming quizzes. <laughs> um, it's still though, you know, given all this interaction, it's still a lot of delivery. So, so that's, that's the same teaching at, at a university or teaching online. You send out a lot of stuff, you, you really invest a lot of time into this. You get, you don't get very much back. So you get a bit of data or, or massive data, uh, depending on how many students you have. Um, but other than that, it's still a tiny fraction of the students interacting. So we are, we are aware of that. Um, but talking about data, we found the data that we collected invaluable. So, so my course, for example, went online in October. I've already exchanged, I think, about 20 of the, of the three minute videos, simply because there was this forum discussion going on where people say, oh, I don't understand this. Or we saw in the statistics that once I start asking the quiz, testing knowledge, um, everybody got it wrong. So, it was a very good feedback for me to see where, where I uh, you know, could be a better teacher and, and then it's very easy to exchange. So it's kind of this optimizing the lecture. You put, you put out something and then you get the feedback from the students and you get a lot of feedback, especially if there's, there's a few <laughs> students who really you know, find everything. Um, and, then you, and then you can just keep on improving your course, so, so advancing it. And every time you know, somebody gives you feedback, it becomes better, which is really, really great concept, also not in traditional university. Jörn just mentioned it. Um, well, so, so the first thing is we learn to focus on quality. Um, the course, and by quality, we don't mean that the course needs to be glossy. If you watch a course on Udacity, it's basically very uh, ugly four-bit color scheme um, with my hand drawing something or Jörn's hand drawing something. But students don't really mind. So as long as uh, nobody ever criticized my drawings, which are, and, and these are Jörn's drawings, these are not my drawings. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it doesn't need to be glossy. As long as you put good effort into didactics and really teaching the, the subject and helping the students, um, everybody, you know, it, it doesn't have to be uh, th that polished as long as you're a good teacher. Um, which also brings us to the picture of, of the, oh, sorry, of the, 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 the naked teacher. Um, if you're teaching an online course, it's very frightening because um, it's all about the students achieving understanding. You know, at at a, any normal setting, you have a certificate to bribe or coerce students with. You know, you say, if you want this certificate, you better listen to me and you better learn this, this, this concept. Read the book, go through it. Um, we don't have anything like that. We don't have certificates. We are basically bound to give good courses or any minute there's a chance we we might lose students. Our courses are eight hours, I, I think, in total, if you watch all the videos, eight hours, ten hours. Plus, like plus tons and tons of extra homework. Of extra homework, so you really need to put in time. The average YouTube video, like five minute YouTube video, I think 10% is watched until the end. So, and, and we're asking students to, to stay with us and do homework for a very, very long time. So what do we think about the critics? Um, 
Well, I already said, you know, much of the, of, of, of the criticism about massive open online courses can also be applied to traditional universities, you know, the, the, the lack of consistent quality. Um, I think this is not something very new. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's mostly also unfair comparisons. So, so if, 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 if you, know, you go out and read what, what most of the criticisms about massive open online courses, or MOOCs, I, I really hate the word, um, is about, it's, it's always taking, oh, this is what the course currently looks like. So you know, we, we did an undercover investigation as students of Udacity or Coursera. And here's Harvard. And it's not like Harvard, so it has to be bad. And, and this is, of course, a very unfair criticism in, in two points. One is, um, wh why should it even be? I mean, as long as the quality is good um, and it's free, it's a great thing to have. And um, we actually think that the online courses, although they try to, don't have to compete with universities. Um, it's just a new resource to learn stuff, um, you know, without a certification or just getting that skill and learning something for free, um, which can't be bad, <laughs> just can't be. It's like... So, how do we proceed from here? <laughs> Futurism. Um, we already mentioned these challenges. Here just, yeah, they are compiled together on one single, uh, on one single slide. Um, so the average MOOC, if you really look into lots of these MOOCs, the average MOOC is not really convincing in terms of quality. But then again, the average university lecturer wouldn't also not be convincing in terms of quality, but nobody <laughs> looks into the standard university lecture. Um, so we need to improve that quality, of course. Who pays for that quality? Big question, big question. Um, and once we introduce business, because somebody has to pay for that quality, once we introduce business, what about our idealism? We want to change the world, we want to save the world. Can we combine that with earning money or having somebody earn that money? Tough spot. And of course, if we really want to provide certificates at the end, if we really want to have students graduate from MOOCs, how could we go about that? Maybe we can also say something to illustrate the point on quality. So mm -hmm. uh, this Udacity course that, that runs for 10 hours, um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of work that goes into that. So it's not, I mean, you know, Jörn and I, we had to prepare it, we had to record it. But after that, all those videos are edited, all those videos are error checked, um, all those videos, the exercises all need to be programmed on the, on the, on the back end, on the front end side. and. So it's, it's automatic grading scripts have to be done. Which automated is the grading scripts. <laughs> yes, which students always tend to break uh, with with their ideas or of what an answer should be. And so so it's it's really a lot of effort and and subsequently a lot of money that goes into production of just a one single course that goes online. For but we have to say, ten years ago, people said, okay, this would be six figure, six digit numbers you would need to spend, say, 1 million euros or 2 million euros to produce such a course. It's not in that order. Yes, we are... Five digit, maybe? I guess we can say five digit. Yeah. It's, it's not as expensive as everybody thought it would be 10 years ago. Um, so, we, we made up three different models. What could happen? Maybe these different models happen in parallel. Maybe we see all three incarnations of of MOOCs in parallel. Um, first thing is MOOCs provide value for employers. MOOCs could teach specific skills required by one employer or by several employers, by a group of employers. The, uh, these employers would pay for that MOOC, for the production of that MOOC, and would be able to pick the best students from those who quote unquote graduate. Um, there would not be a formal certificate, you just would prove by doing the exercises, by doing your homework that you are able to do it and maybe that company on their own runs some in-house tests to check if you really are able to do it. That's what we see as one option of combining businesses or bringing businesses on, on that playing field. And actually that's what's happening, that was the original business model of Udacity and Coursera also has now taken over partially taken over that sort of business model, cooperation with, uni with employers. Um, doing some kind like, like um, how would you call that in English, um, scouting, uh, talent scouting. Talent scouting. 
Um, second model. Um, this may be the way that almost all, all universities are heading, uh, apart from the elite institutions, um, trying to reduce cost. As Sebastian said, there are, there's us, expensive professors teaching, um, telling the same stuff every year that we told the year before, we just are no longer needed anymore. That's the assumption. Um, can we do that with MOOCs and can we hence reduce the cost? Question is, what about quality? As we know, the quality of university education is not that good. Um, does it get better? Does it get worse? Hard to say. Third model, that would be the, let's say, the style of model that I would uh, propose to this audience. Could you help <laughs> us with that model? Could we have some sort of Wikipedia style MOOCs? Could we have some crowdsourcing going on here? Could we collaboratively, collaboratively, that's a collaboratively. <laughs> collaboratively create MOOCs for free for everybody? Um, of course, there's lots of technical issues here. Um, for instance, collaboratively editing video, recording video, that's a tough point. And um, Wikipedia was easy to do in, in that way that you simply have to agree of once, on, on one single entry to that, uh, to that encyclopedia. But in this case, you have to agree for, you have to agree about say eight hours or 16 hours of lectures, quizzes and whatever. Can you do that? Um, with say 100 persons cooperating, hard to say. And it's also that that uh, you know, if you compare it to Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article usually becomes better if you you know if you find something missing and you add it. Yep. It usually becomes better. A lecture does not become better just by adding stuff. So so a good lecture is also about leaving out certain certain this things. Is, which, this is what we learned. The hardest yeah. part is to know what to leave out. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to have debated that with, with anybody else. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, no it's, it's actually a choice you have to make as a lecturer. It's, it's not something you put out into a discussion. It's, it's your choice. That's what you, it's, it's kind of the artistic freedom you, you have as, when giving a lecture. <laughs> the last remaining artistic freedom yep. that we have. So are we on the way? So that's our, our uh, initial question. Are we on the way to freeing education? Well, first of all, there's our final quiz uh, for you. How much funding have the three big companies, the three big MOOC companies, Coursera, edX, and Udacity, received so far? And actually, they've all received it in 2012 because that's when they were um, founded or, or announced in case of Udacity. Have they in total received $10 million in funding? Okay. Who thinks it's $25 million? $25 million. <laughs> Who thinks it's $100 million? It actually is $100 million in funding. So $100 million in funding. I, I wish you know, getting startup money was that easy all the time. <laughs> um, so what about free education? I mean, I mean you know, somebody is spending $100 million. Somebody will want something back for those $100 Plus interest. Million. Plus interest, um, which in the case of venture capital is, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10%? 10% per year. 50? 100? <laughs> It's a lot. Um, <laughs> so, well, in the case of freeing education, we, we definitely think yes. You know, so, so, so if, if you don't talk about the, the money aspect of it, it's never been easier to publish content. Producing good content and a good course is still hard, but if you have a good lecture, it's easy to put it out there um, and, and you know, get an audience for it. It's also easier with this concept if we talk about you know, getting rid of the old habits that don't make sense. If, if you want to design a course the way you think it should be, MOOCs, I think, are the easiest way to, to do that. Um, and you can also leave out obsolete content, you know, update the curriculum. That's a very nice, nice thing about it. Um, and a good thing is also that it challenges the traditional university. So, you know, Udacity, there's a company that just puts out a statement. They have just shown, oh, each year we can educate, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 programmers for free. Uh, so what is the university going to do? So, um, and rather than saying, you know, you know, having a big speech about we need to improve education, they just show that there's an alternative model. And I, I think, you know, that challenge is always good for a system like that. Um, 
Crowdsourcing, of course, that's also a model, although so far we haven't seen much success w with that. We also have to have to add that. There's just not, you know, the crowdsourcing always depends on, on this critical mass of people actually engaging in, in, in the topic, and we haven't seen that yet, unfortunately. We, we see that in translations. In particular, yeah. Salman Khan has some success in that. Um, you can also go out and translate Udacity courses if you want to, <laughs> but it doesn't really pick up at the moment. Yeah. So that's... Then the other question, so we've just seen $100 million. Um, free education? Well, you know, it's somewhat. So, so it's still free to sign up for the courses and take them, but somebody has to pay for it, um, you know, and the interest. And so who will pay? Um, that's a question I think that's, that's still very, very open. And it kind of depends on the goal of education. So that's where the larger debate again comes in. So if employment and employability are the sole goal of education, and that is the way I think we treat education a lot of the time, it, not being said that that's the way it should be, but that's the way how it's treated with your certificate and everything, um, then maybe it's going to be the commercial route of you know, the, the free course and then the employers getting, getting data. Or if there's something more idealistic to strive for, um, then yeah, I guess we all have to pay. <laughs> I know if something happens. <laughs> we want to close with another quote. Books will soon be obsolete in schools. It's possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with a motion picture. Our school system will be completely changed in 10 years. <laughs> We should have used that as a quiz. Maybe some of you know this is one century old. <laughs> um, we should be telling you that the educational system is a very slow mover. But there's hope. But there is hope. <laughs> Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you very much, Jörn and Sebastian. Um, when I first entered this room uh, on day one of the Congress, I had the feeling, well, it looks like, it, it reminds me of the old university days, somebody standing in front holding a lecture, the rest of the crowd receiving, um, nothing bi-directional, so I was very the curious The first three about rows, nobody said <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I'm missing the A students, <laughs> the A plus students. <laughs> I was very curious about what we, would learn from you this morning and uh, I'm really amazed it's been a terrific interesting talk Thank you. and uh, we do have some time for questions and answer so for those in the room please queue up in front of the microphones and um, do we have questions uh, from the IRC? Uh, yes, we have one question? Yes, uh, I would like to start with the uh, Congress Everywhere question. Okay. Uh, what about Kickstarter, Kickstarter funded online university? Yeah, a, a good idea. Um, hard, to, hard to say. Uh, even better would be a Kickstarter-founded uh, course. So if, if you put up something on Kickstarter saying, I want to teach, for instance me, I want to teach general relativity, would, be, would somebody be wanting to pay for that? That would be a great idea, yeah. My next, que uh, the next question to my left, please. Hi, I have a couple of observations and a question. First one is uh, the population that opts to go to uh, uh, online teaching, let's put aside all the bad students because you have them everywhere. These are people that a priori have better chance of doing that online. It's like pretty much, I'm assuming half the people in this room that studied most of what they know themselves. So yep. that's kind of something you have to take into consideration when you consider uh, the effectiveness of, uh, and success rate of online teaching. Second thing is, I think that the, um, not necessarily certificate, but the reputation of the studies is what actually is going to determine the future of it. And I think that a good example for that, I'm Israeli and in Israel for the past 10 years, there have existed a few um, programming courses in the military. Now the people that took these courses um, left the military starting in 2004 and for the past eight years, there's a growing um, change in the reputation that people get today in Israel. There are certain programming courses that if you take them in the military, you get a better job and a better salary than if you have a university degree. Mm -hmm. So, and that is, that is based solely on reputation. People that got out of the military after taking these courses started working, people saw what they knew. So maybe, maybe this is something you need to take uh, into your plans. And my question is, one of the things that differentiates 
physical studies from online studies is the ability of the pupil to ask a question during the class. Now, you've mentioned three minute videos and that's, okay, that's easy because you ask the question and if I can't answer, then you know something was wrong. But I'm assuming that over time, the lectures will become longer and longer if this concept uh, succeeds. How do you m suppose uh, you could uh, address that issue? Concerning the, the length of the lectures, so the Udacity style lectures are at most three minutes or so. Uh, on Coursera, it's rather like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, they do not spend that much effort, I guess, on creating quizzes. And that's hard, yeah. So it would depend on the vendor, if you will. Mm. Um, I do not think that these, these videos are going to, are bound to become longer. It no, I, I think it, I think it, you know there's an optimal point. So so um, what we found is that the quizzes are actually an essential part of engaging. So normally you would say it's disruptive, um, but in terms of teaching, it's actually better uh, because with a video, there's just you know there's too many distractions, right? You open a video on YouTube, uh, you never watch that video. Just you, you you do your email, you do something else. You get the ads. Yes, exactly. With, um, you know, with lots of quizzing and interaction, you basically force the student to stay with you. Um, so, so I see that this three minute thing, I think, is, is kind of a sweet spot. Uh, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's just one, but um, that's, I, I think that's the format we have for now. Well, my question was I go the other way around. Quizzes when you ask me a question. What happens when I need to ask you a question? What oh, yeah, if I didn't that's on the forum. forum. Yeah, that's yeah. on the forum. Yeah. And, and, and you we'll try interact. to answer within one day. Yeah. Okay. We at least, <laughs> some other instructors. But I wanted to comment on your first remark. Um, you said this is not for everybody. And indeed, uh, for my own local students that I have at my own University of Applied Sciences, these courses would be hard to take, mm -hmm. indeed. Yep. So that's a sort of self-select audience. Thank you. Next question to my right, please. Yeah, th <coughs> thanks. It was very interesting. Um, you were asking why there is no crowdsourcing going on and why Coursera courses are not being translated, etc. I think if there is anything we learned from the Wikimedia movement is that the whole ecosystem has to be based on vo voluntarism and I think people feel in their guts that someone is making money mm -hmm. uh, at Coursera, mm -hmm. at Udacity, etc. For it to actually work, the, it has to be based, the professors have to be volunteering their time, mm -hmm. the, the, edit, the video editors have to be volunteering their time, the programmers doing the back end and front end scripting for the tests. Every, it has to be very I idealistic and based on, on total volunteerism. Then it might work because the yeah. technology is there. What, the, Udacity or Coursera, or though Coursera has a .org uh, <laughs> domain name, they're actually a company. <laughs> and, and, and so, so people shy away from, uh, from actually helping out, I think, with, with uh, this kind of crowdsourcing. And I agree that video editing, for example, is not the best task for a wiki like uh, massive editing, but. but you will find volunteers if, if you're doing it completely uh, in, a, in, a, in an idealistic fashion. Yes, fashion. I think. I, I think if that will happen. No, no. I, I think it's it's the idealism, but it's also um, I think you know. <laughs> Crowdsourcing, so there's so many opportunities out there to devote your time, even if you want to be active in that education space. And, and I guess, you know, if you're volunteering your time, you also want to know who's, who's going to come out on top, right? You don't want to spend all your time uh, translating a course for our company or organization A if in two years nobody's watching that anymore. And that, this is just where the, the space has, there's, there, there hasn't been the consolidation yet that I think would also attract the, the, the interest of volunteers. But as I said, it seems to be working with Salman Khan. Yeah, and Khan is very, you know, yeah, so, so you're right. Khan That's is the best example for perhaps for... Uh, he is funded by Bill Gates and by Google. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not doing this as a real job, maybe. Yeah, yeah. you don't feel ripped off. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a big point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I should be mentioning that the uh, Udacity videos, all Udacity videos, are directly available available on YouTube if you search for them and can be downloaded as well. That's not true for all mm. the providers here. Yeah. They are rather open. Yeah. Thank you. We do have another question on IRC. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a long one. Um, my most technically knowledgeable teacher uses Moodle, a website for quizzes and sharing notes. When I approached him concerning filming classes or at least the interactive whiteboard, he told me that research was, has found that students perform worse because there is no interactive, interactivity with the teacher. I disagree because when I'm stuck at home revising, I could really use these videos to at least help. What do you think? Um, 
Yeah, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I mean, the best, the best thing, of course. So it's it's always it's it's almost brutal, but but it is a question of financial investment in in the end. I mean, the best thing would, of course, be if we could afford to have one-on-one -on -one tutoring for everybody, because that is the the most effective method. But um, there's actually research that shows that you can emulate that effectiveness by you know providing giving students the time that they need by having reinforced learning. Um, and all of these things can be emulated with, with MOOCs. Uh, so so it's, it's kind of the next best thing, I, I think. And every, every teacher should actually, you know, every teacher and lecturer, I think, should be happy about recording the lecture. Um, because first of all, it's a public service that they provide, in my mind. And the other thing is just um, also this, this self-critical look. You know, you can watch yourself lecturing, see what's going wrong, um, improve, and- You are told what's going wrong. You are told <laughs> <laughs> the audience. Will tell. I, I should be mentioning some research about videos as well. Um, so everybody seems to be thinking that videos is the way to go. You watch a video and then you've learned something. No, you didn't. This is what I see with my own students. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm doing this uh, flipped classroom style of teaching. Uh, all my students, almost all, uh, watch videos at home, come to class, and we discuss about these things. And this is really. It's really so tiny what they've learned. I, I do see that they really watch those videos. Everybody has filled in uh, the gaps in, in the lecture notes, but that's not really knowing. You have to really work with these things, do quizzes, do problems, whatever. <laughs> just watching the videos doesn't cut it. Yeah, which also shows the lecture is just the start after that. Yeah. The interactive yeah. element, again, is very important in this thing. Thank you. Microphone one, please. So three distinct things. Um, the first is that the self-select nature of the students, that may actually be valuable, uh, a valuable industrial fact. I mean, you want to employ people that are self-starters, that are self-motivated. So the very fact Indeed. that you got to this course is in itself valuable. Um, regarding the interaction that you get from one-to-one -one tuition, at least part of that, in my experience, is that the tutor can see from the student's response whether or not they are understanding the explanation that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you could emulate this using you know, the webcam in your uh, laptop to look at the student's expression and potentially branch to a, a, an alternate explanation if they are just looking completely... That, that you know, it be might be a data in, privacy uh, issue, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's just uh, pick your preferred explanation. Yeah. Do I prefer an automotive analogy if such a thing is... Yeah. Oh, the self-adapting course, yeah. yes. Yeah. So yes. The, the third item, and this is a personal observation, is that I find it much harder to retain information from electronic media. So mm -hmm. I shifted almost all of my reading material to a Kindle a little while back, but I've discovered that actually it kind of merges in my head um, right. when compared to reading on paper notes. So anything detailed I actually put out on paper and I found a similar thing on video. Do you know if there's any research around <laughs> media and retention? I don't. Uh, I don't. That style? No, I don't remember something about comparing video and reading. But the interesting part is, I mean, the reading is already out there. So, yeah. so it's, it's actually, I, and, and I agree, you know, I, I also like, so for example, with mathematics, I, I cannot stand if somebody tries to explain it to me without having, having the time to, to really read, read the text. That's just the way that I learned that. Um, but, but that's okay. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just an alternate way of, of offering, you know, of, of replacing the lecture, basically. Um, of course, you will still have reading materials. Of course, you still have to, um, you, 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 just because you have the video, the learning doesn't become any easier. Um, you still have to put in the time and effort. You're just building, building a better bridge, I think. I'm not necessarily talking about just video. It's the, the actual media it's presented on. So it, it, may be a oh, okay. it may be a generational thing, but text on a Kindle, I do not retain as well as text on a paper page. That's an interesting one. <laughs> you can put that to your research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. uh, time, for, time for the next one, I think. Yeah. yeah, but I wanted to, to, to comment on your first remark. Um, so there's this idea about uh, multiple choice tests. If you do the right type of multiple choice quizzes, the idea is you can learn about what the student uh, did wrong. Did he confuse some square roots and sums and whatever uh, by just providing the right set of answers to that multiple choice yeah. quiz. That's the idea, the very 
optimistic idea, and I guess that never worked out. And it's just freakingly hard to, to design yeah. Uh, yeah. multiple choice quizzes like that. But, but it's actually possible. I think yeah. I've, I've had a few cases, uh, you know, the videos that I replaced where actually I found uh, students were always picking the wrong answer. And, and that made me look into why, why are they doing that? And then I found out it just explained something in the wrong way. Um, so, so it is possible to get some feedback from the data. And speaking about one-to-one -one tutoring, what really works best for me at least is I sit next to the student, ask the students, ask the student, so how do, I, how do you go about this problem? What are you going to do? And the student has to tell me what she or he is going to do. I'm not asking any question apart from this is the problem, now you are, now yeah. it's your turn. That works best for me. Yeah, and that's hard to emulate. That's hard, hard to emulate. So uh, let's pretend for a moment we have education to ensure employability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do you propose to do about, you know, the people that are going to, in, uh, I mean, okay, reputation there is everything. So, what do you propose to do to, for, for people that are going to show up just to take the course, to get the paper and make sure they're employable for some kind of cushy job? And also, what do you propose to do, how do you bootstrap this reputation so the employers are going to start trusting you and giving you, you know, funding? to continue your endeavors, as you mm. propose? Okay, so, so I think the first question, um, you know, that's, that's just the way it's always going to be. I think it's unavoidable. So you're always going to have people, you know, you're going to have people taking the course with a certain goal in mind. And if that goal in mind is to get a certain job and they just rush, what are you going to do? It's, it's something that's, that's, that's happening today. Um, you know, people, and, and I guess that's going to happen with online courses as well. It's just, um, maybe, maybe one thing though is, is that as you take the individual online courses, you're actually building a portfolio of, of your skills. So that might be a certain, you know, a certain way, way around that because actually, you know, you, by your choices of the portfolio, you kind of show your interests. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, in the end, um, you, cannot, you cannot avoid it. Um, there's another phenomenon, I guess, going on, which is way more important than that. Uh, students are flocking to these MOOCs just for remediation. They are looking for, say, an introduction to the T-statistics or the, the chi-square test or MP completeness mm -hmm. or how to solve partial differential equation just, just for a single topic. And they try to use these courses to learn what they need to learn for their test at home. Mm -hmm. They're not actually taking that course. What was your second question? You, you had a... um, it's basically the same. If you have lawyer for reputation for your course, um, how do you, ah, for okay. example, you proposed funding from the employers. How do you bootstrap this reputation so the employers are going to actually trust you? Um, it's, it's dialogue. So, 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 so what, well, there's, there's two ways of doing it. Um, the way that, that uh, Coursera and edX are doing it, um, they're basically, although they're very strict about separating it from the universities that they come from. I mean, they all come from, uh, were founded by Ivy League universities in the end, so they try to use part of that reputation. But also their goal is not as much employability as Udacity. Udacity is just actively engaging with employers. So um, as much time as, as, as they spend into, into designing courses, um, they also spend time just going to employers and, and tell them, so what, it is, you know, what is it that you need? How can, we, how can we be attractive? And just as any other company would, you know, they're, they're looking for customers. Um, there's now four uh, Udacity courses announced for early 2013 which are done by people from uni uh, which are done by people from industry yeah so somebody from autodesk will teach you about uh, ray tracing 3d and, and all of that somebody from um, nvidia will teach you uh, how to use cuda, I CUDA think, yeah. Yeah. stuff like that yeah. so industry is going to teach that's the easiest thing <laughs> okay as time is limited uh, we're going to make the one question from irc the last one for this morning um, the interest is really great. Uh, I see around about a dozen people lined up here. So uh, those of you who haven't got the chance to ask the question, I hope the uh, We're around. We're around. speaker We're around. will be available We're after around. this talk. And uh, for those of you attending online, um, the contact details are here on the slides or in the far plan. So we cover uh, all social media. So actually, so we have <laughs> time to reach out. So I would like to ask the. Is missing. I would like to ask the uh, signal angel for the last question, please. All right. Do you see a chance that there'll be a fully fledged studies held by uh, MOO, <coughs> MOOCs? So, sorry, I didn't get that question. 
Do you see there is do you see a chance that there will be fully fledged studies held by MOOCs? Oh, so a full program. Full pro so, like, did you get an online an online bachelor's degree? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I see sure. no. Yeah. It looks as though, for instance, Udacity is slowly moving to a complete uh, computer science curriculum. The, the interesting question will be what a full-fledged study is, is actually, um, you know, if, if you actually need all those courses, or if, if you say, you know, we take a certain selection of that and that will be sufficient, but in the end, yes, that's what will happen. Cool. Please say a big thank you to Jörn Lobby-Schach and Sebastian Bernicke.